All right, thank you, thank you. All right, uh, good, uh, is it morning? Good morning, everyone. I've just returned from a trip to Europe, and so um, my, my body is here, but I, I feel like I'm still in Italy as far as my sleep schedule goes. So uh, great to be here, and yes, I, 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 as I mentioned yesterday, I am sometimes referred to as having been a punk rocker, but I'm going to explain to you today why I am still a punk rocker, and just to sort of emphasize that, I purposefully left my shirt untucked, right? <laughs> This is a very punk rock move. I am, I am jettisoning social norms today, and I'm standing up in front of you with a shirt untucked. Now, I have been given quite a fascinating title, and I'm looking forward to it. The title today is The Punk, The Parsley, and The Prophet, right? Now, remember the first time that Julian sent me this title, and I was like, man, that's a really audacious title. Let's see what I can do with that. The Punk, The Parsley, and The Prophet. Well, the punk is the easiest one here because that is me, right? So I'm going to talk to you today about what it means that I was a punk rocker and what it means to some degree that I am still a punk rocker. I want to start by going back to sort of the beginning of my life, and this is a picture of my family, right? I'm there in the tan suit. That's my younger brother, Robert, in the blue suit. But as you look at this picture, you're going to notice probably that there is something missing. What's missing from this picture? Yeah, there's not a father figure there, is there? What you see is my mom and me and my brother, and then really what was my father figure, and that was my granddad, Charles Oakley Atkins, and then my grandmother Rita, two of the best human beings I ever had the privilege to know. And uh, some people ask me if I feel a lot of pain and have this sort of fatherless uh, wound, and the answer is in a way yes and in a way no. Um, for many of us that grow up in an age which in which absentee fatherism or absenteeism with, with fathers is common, um, yes, it certainly is a major problem, a societal problem. But in my particular case, I also had a really supportive set of grandparents who raised me and sort of occupied that fatherly role, right? And so for me, this just feels normal, right? My wife, who's just over there somewhere, she uh, has two brothers and two sisters, just as I have. But in her case, her two brothers and two sisters, including her, so all five of the family members, come from the same parents, and they all look exactly the same. And to me, that's the weirdest thing. I'm like, look at your family. You all have the same mom and dad. That's so weird, <laughs> right? Right? It's not a very modern family. It's more of a traditional family, and my family's very modern. We have five of us, and we've got different moms and different dads, and we're all just sort of stuck together, but that feels normal for me, right? That's my normal. Well, not a few years after my mom was married, not just the first time, but also a second time, uh, the second time my mom married, uh, the best thing that came out of that marriage was my younger brother, who you just saw in the picture a moment ago. So already, there's just two boys, one mom, two dads, right? And then my mom met this man here, a man by the name of Richard Lane Asherick. And Richard Lane Asherick, that's the last name that I bear today. Uh, some women, of course, have numerous last names. If they're married, they have their, if they're, you know, born, they have their maiden name, and then they marry and they get their married name. And like my mom, if you're married several times and you have several last names, most men don't have this privilege. They don't get the luxury of having numerous last names. I've had three last names. I was born David Cross, I was adopted David Dormany, and then I was adopted again as David Asherick, right? So I've had three last names, and this man here... Richard Asherick became my dad, my adoptive father, by my own choice and by my younger brother's own choice when we were in our, just about our teen years, about 11, 12 years old. And uh, he was the first real dad that I ever had. My first dad left when I was three weeks old. The second dad that came on the scene was around for about eight years, but even though I bore his last name, David Dormany, he wasn't my dad in any significant sense, and when he left... Both my brother and I, whose last name at that point was Dormany, we were so impressed with this guy. Frankly, we were not in the beginning. We were sort of turned off by this guy. He was the, the third dad on the scene, and we had a lot of things against him, but he was just such a kind, wonderful man. He just treated us like we were his own children. And I remember one day I walked down the hallway to go to my brother's room. This is after Richard had been in our lives for about a year and a half, and I was going down the hallway to tell my younger brother that I had made the decision to be adopted and to, and to take on Richard's last name, and no longer call him Richard, but to start calling him dad. 
And when I opened up the door to talk to Robert about this, he said, hey, I've been thinking about being adopted, and I think I want to take on um, the last name Asherick. And we both made the choice at the same time. It was really quite remarkable. And so I, got to, I like to say that I chose my dad, right? I chose that Richard would be my dad, and it's a real honor to bear his name. He has treated my... They've been married now for since that time. So I was about 12 years old. I'm 45 now. So 33 years they've been married. And uh, he is my dad. He's my father. He's an amazing father to my younger brother. These two then adopted a younger sister, or a, a, a younger sister for us and a daughter for them. So that's what I mean when I say our family's complicated, super complicated. He also brought two of his own into the marriage, and they didn't even have the same parents. So if, you know, I could write a novel on this, right? <laughs> But to me, it's just the most normal thing in the world. Well, one of the things that really endeared me to this man, Richard Asherick, who spent more than 30 years in the American Air Force, uh, he was truly an officer and a gentleman and somebody who's still alive today and who I just look up to as, again, one of the best human beings I ever had the privilege to know. And one of the things that he did, really smart, really wise, in order to endear himself to this new uh, family that he'd you know, come into, he married my mom, the story that he tells, my mom confirms the story, is that when she walked in to a little place there in Cheyenne, Wyoming, called the Hitching Post, my father-to-be, Richard, turned to his friend for the first time he's seeing my mom, and he says, I will marry that woman. And six weeks later, they were married. <laughs> now, following in the footsteps of my dad, when I met my wife, Violetta, I asked her to marry me six weeks later. It's a true story. And they've been happily married for over 30 years, and Violet and I have been happily married for 18 years. Really a great story. I like to say it this way, when you know, you know, right? And one of the things that Richard did to really endear himself to me and to my younger brother, Robert, is he bought us skateboards. And uh, my mother was not at all pleased because she could see broken arms, broken limbs. She was a nurse and uh, a single mom, just an absolute hero of a human being. And uh, so when he bought us skateboards, she was like, what are you doing? My children are going to be covered in scars and wounds. And she was right. We did end up being covered in scabs and lots of broken bones. But from about the age of 11 to 12 years old, I became super passionate about two things in life. Number one was skateboarding. And the second thing that goes along with skateboarding was punk rock music, right? Really loud, really aggressive, really fast music. At the age of about 12, I started skateboarding. At the age of 18, I moved to Southern California to try my hand as a professional skateboarder and just throw myself into this burgeoning new sport, extreme sport as some called it, skateboarding. Here's a couple pictures of me when I was young. And in addition to the sort of skateboarding lifestyle, there was also the punk rock lifestyle. And punk rock music was very aggressive, it was very fast paced. And I got involved in punk rock bands and punk rock music at a young age. Here I am singing in one of the bands that I was in called Via. And uh, I think I'm probably 21 years old in this picture, super passionate about two things in life, punk rock music and skateboarding. Here's another band that I was in. That's me in the upper left-hand corner. These are my bandmates here playing at a large show in Detroit, Michigan. And you might be sitting there thinking, oh, that music, bad music, bad influence, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But that was not the case in the music that we played and that we listened to. I'm not suggesting that any of you here would like the music particularly, but the message of the music was actually really, really positive. In fact, it was because of bands like this, a band called Minor Threat, and the gentleman that's sitting there on the front step is a fellow by the name of Ian McKay. He was the lead singer and the, the front man of the band Minor Threat. You can see there on the album cover, probably one of their best known albums, Out of Step, right? You have all of these sheep that are going in one direction, and then there's this black sheep that's out of step. Well, what Ian McKay and Minor Threat meant when they said out of step is they were out of step with the way the world was going. And in one particular way, something that Ian McKay sort of founded and made popular was something called straight edge. I wonder by a raising of hands here, does anybody know what that means when you talk about being a straight edge punk rocker? Not a single hand. Okay, maybe my wife knows. Okay, great. One hand. Okay, Straight Edge was a song that Ian McKay wrote and that Minor Threat performed that basically said, I don't smoke and I don't drink. It was the idea that you wanted to take care of your body and you wanted to live in a healthy and responsible way, right? And this was a message that became really a part of my ethos, a part of what made David Asherick tick at about the age of 17. Well, the launching of this Straight Edge movement launched a whole bunch of other bands, bands like Youth of Today. And it was young, a bunch of young people, super aggressive in terms of the music, but really positive in terms of the message. 
right? Staying away from drugs, trying to live a healthy life, a responsible life, staying away from alcohol and cigarettes and trying to be a positive influence. In fact, one of the sort of languages that, the, one of the sayings that we use, the language that we used in the day was PPP, positive peer pressure, right? It, it, using our peer pressure on our friends to, to turn away from drugs, to turn away from cigarettes, to turn away from alcohol. And what we would do, as you can see on the t-shirt here on the right, is we would put X's on our hands, right? Some of my friends took this so seriously, they even got the X's tattooed on their hands, right? So this was really part of the punk rock ethos. Lots of tattoos, lots of fast, aggressive music, but really healthful, socially conscious, and positive living. Well, a really remarkable thing happened. This guy here that's in the picture on the left is a fellow by the name of Ray Capo. If you look carefully, you can see he's got a giant X on his right hand. And a remarkable thing happened with Ray Capo, who ate in my house, who I spent time with, who's somebody that was really a punk rock icon in the 80s and the 90s in the hardcore punk rock scene. He converted to religion and became a Hare Krishna. By a raising of hands, how many people know what a Hare Krishna is? Okay, they're sort of like Hindus, and we've got uh, uh, quite a large Krishna community where I live, near where I live in Murwillumbah. And they're vegetarian. They're also really into healthful living. And Ray Capo transitioned out of that band, Youth of Today, and he started a band called Shelter. These are two of the albums that they released. And I want you to notice the language that's used on these albums. The one on the right here says, A Quest for Certainty. The one on the left says, In Defense of Reality. What had happened for Ray Capo and an increasing number of straight-edge punk rockers is that we were saying, yes, we want to live positively, we want to have a positive impact on the world, but why? And this began to turn the minds of many of them slowly to religion, and the religion that was sort of popular at the time was the religion of Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna is sort of a version of Hinduism and uh, built around a book called the Bhagavad Gita as it is, and really advocated vegetarianism, animal rights, and healthful living. Well, this band, Shelter, came to my town when I was about 18 years old, and cooked food for everybody, vegetarian food. I was not a vegetarian at the time. And uh, sort of advocated, you know, thinking about something other than just yourself. What about the animals? What about, what about the planet? What, and they sort of broadened my mind away from just the straight edge scene and the skateboarding scene to sort of taking a, a wider, bigger view on the nature of reality and the nature of, of factory farming and animals and all of that thing, which did not go over very well with my grandfather that I showed you in the first picture. My grandfather was a rancher and he, he, he just could never get his mind around the idea. I mean, to the day I died, he just, even though I was certainly his favorite grandson, he would tell you that, um, he just could not get his mind around the idea that I wasn't eating meat. He's like, listen, man, if, you, if, you, if it wasn't for meat, you wouldn't have food to eat. You he, was, he just could not get his mind around it. He loved the fact that I wasn't smoking, wasn't drinking, wasn't doing drugs, but at every opportunity, he would put bacon or beef or something in front of me. And I said, hey, you know, granddad, I'm not going to eat that. Wish. It, it, just, it was this like source of really kind of funny and humorous tension in our family. Well, just at about this time, at the age of 19, I became exposed to this man. And I'd be really surprised if anybody in here knew who he was. Raising of hands, anybody know who this guy is? Okay, only my son knows. Well, his name is John Robbins, and he is the son of one of the, founding, uh, uh, one of the founders of Baskin Robbins Ice Cream. How many people know what Baskin Robbins Ice Cream is? Okay, every hand goes up. Okay. Now, here's the thing about Baskin Robbins Ice Cream. It's the number one... Uh, it's the largest specialty ice cream store in the world, right? It's worth millions and millions of dollars, franchises all over the world, all over the United States. And John Robbins was the heir apparent to the Baskin Robbins empire. He's the son. He's going to take on Baskin Robbins, all of this milk and all of this cream and all of these sweeteners and all of this sugar. And to everyone's astonishment, certainly his father's, he turned his back on it. And he began to say, is this really healthy? Is it healthy to eat these high sugar, low, high fat, low fiber diet? And he turned his back on it and he wrote a book called Diet for a New America. This book was like the Bible for David Asherick for about the age of sort of 18, 19. I read this book again and again, just digested it. Diet for a New America, how your food choices affect your health, your happiness, and the future of life on earth. 
Now, what you, what you can begin to see is a number of things are coalescing in my young, sort of teenage, early 20 mind, right? I'm a straight edge person. That means I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I'm staying away from those things. I'm trying to live positively. I'm trying to live in a socially conscious way. And now I'm becoming increasingly interested in animal welfare and vegetarianism, healthful living in terms of what I put in my body, and also environmental responsibility. John Robbins would write things like this, your life does matter, right? He would say this, and this was speaking into my mind. I was not a religious person by any means, right? Not by any means. I was sort of tossed to and fro, as I mentioned, in my family situation at a young age, and religion was never a major part of my life or my family's life. So here, what's happening is, is that religious ideas are coming in in a fairly circuitous way. And it was through, for me, the writings of John Robbins and music from bands like Shelter. It says, your life does matter. It always matters whether you reach out in friendship or lash out in anger. It always matters whether you live with compassion and awareness or whether you succumb to distractions and trivia. It always matters how you treat other people, how you treat animals, how you treat yourself. It always matters what you do. It always matters what you say, and it always matters what you eat. And so if you would summarize David Asherick's punk rock values, they would look like this. At the age of about 18, 19 years old, I was socially conscious. I wanted to build my life around loving others. I was really passionate about issues like nonviolence, equality, and positivity. I was a straight edger, which as I've mentioned, was no drugs, no cigarettes, no alcohol. I wanted to live a healthy lifestyle. I was interested in animal welfare and really passionate about being a, aware that factory farming was something that was increasingly environmentally unsustainable, which is the next one there, environmental responsibility. And I was also learning to question authority, to question tradition, and to question social norms. Right? So this is my, the punk rock ethos that sort of was creating the person that David Asherick is. Well, in my little town there, in right in the middle of the United States of America called Rapid City, South Dakota, a vegetarian restaurant opened up called, unimaginatively enough, Veggies, right? Veggies. And Veggies was owned by these really weird people called Seventh-day Adventists. And the thing that I remember most about them is that they dressed like the Amish, number one, and number two, they called everybody brother or sister. And so shortly after they uh, learned my name, uh, maybe on the second or third visit, I would come and say, oh, it's Brother David. And they had this kind of wholesome, you know, uh, little house on the prairie feel about it. And it was, I thought they were the weirdest people on the earth. Now, I was a straight edge punk rocker with tattoos and earrings and purple hair, blue hair, yellow hair, no hair, dreadlocked hair. I mean, I, I thought they were weird. What would they have thought about me? So here I am. Uh, in my punk rock stage, I'm there on the left. This is with the drummer and uh, my band, Daniel Lockridge. And you can see I'm actually standing in the restaurant, Veggies, and I have a shirt on that says Straight Edge. Can't beat the feeling. I was really passionate about Straight Edge, but I was becoming increasingly interested in these weird Seventh-day Adventist people, these Christian people. And the thing that probably, no, not, not probably, certainly sort of endeared me to them is that they were like me. They were straight edge, they were vegetarian, and they wanted to live their lives in a really socially conscious and positive way. And so when I would go in, I would start to ask questions and say, well, what about this? And why do you do this? And what do you think about this? And we started having really cool dialogues and conversations and interactions. And then one day, the owner of the restaurant, this woman here on your left, my right, named Mary... Burnt is her last name, which isn't the best name for somebody that's opening a restaurant. She is a phenomenal cook, the second best cook in the world, second to my wife, Mary Burnt. And uh, she said, well, I, how about this? How about if we offer you a job? And so I started working in this restaurant, and slowly but surely, her principles and her values, and especially her commitment to the Bible and to God and to Jesus, began to seep into me. I had already been somewhat inclined toward religious ideas when I'd been exposed to those Hare Krishna punk rockers about a year before. The Hare Krishna thing, I tried it out for about two or three months, but it just didn't stick with me. It just, it did, I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. I read the holy book there, the Bhagavad Gita, but it just, it wasn't resonating with me. And uh, a really cool thing happened at about this time. How many of you know who Woody Harrelson is? Woody Harrelson, famous Hollywood actor. Woody Harrelson was shooting a film in, in my town 
And he came into our vegetarian restaurant because he too was a vegan vegetarian. So I sat down, had a conversation with Woody Harrelson about straight edge, about vegetarianism, about marijuana, in fact. I wasn't a marijuana user, but um, he was. He was really passionate about it, in fact. And I was reading this book called The Great Controversy. It's this book right here. I was just beginning to read this book because Mary had given me this book and said, look, you've got a lot of questions about God, about life, about religion. Just read this book and see what you think about it. Well, I was, I don't know, maybe halfway or a third of the way through the book. And so I was like, man, I'm reading this book. Let me give you this book that's really powerful to me. And I had the privilege of giving Woody Harrelson a great controversy, giving him my testimony and saying, I think you'd really enjoy this book based on this conversation that we're having. Well, the straight edge punk rock ethic taught me a lot about the what, but not enough about the why. And it was this book, The Great Controversy, that started to fill in the blanks. Not just what, what we should we do and how should we live, but the larger question that people like Ian McKay and Ray Capo and John Robbins were asking. Why? Why live in this way? Why behave in these socially responsible, positive, healthful, environmentally sensitive ways? And so I started reading the book, The Great Controversy. And the book, The Great Controversy, is an amazing book because basically it's just the history of the Christian church. The very stuff that Justin Lawman was just talking to you about a moment ago is the very stuff that's in this book. And especially about the first three or four hundred pages, it's just a retracing of the Protestant Reformation. And as I began to learn about this book that was so valued by these religious people, people like John Huss and Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Wesley and others, and I began to learn about the many thousands and millions of martyrs that were dying because they were passionate about this book, it dawned on me, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's something in that book worth reading. And so this book, The Great Controversy, drove me to this next book that I'm sure all of you have heard of called The Bible. And I started reading the Bible and I became particularly interested in, as I discussed yesterday, some of the biblical prophecies. Right yesterday we talked about the third one there, dozens of Messianic prophecies, what we call here the Christmas prophecies. And then down at the bottom here, The Great Controversy by Ellen White began to unpack really powerfully some of these biblical prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Now, I want to give you eight reasons today why you should take seriously not just the, the, the Great Controversy book, but the book that the Great Controversy points to, and that's the Bible. Reason number one is that the story of Jesus is utterly compelling. That was a story that resonated with me. I couldn't get my mind wrapped around the Hare Krishna story, but the story of Jesus immediately appealed to me. Reason number two, the story is experientially persuasive. Even though I had a real desire to live this healthful, positive life, I still failed in many regards. I would sing about this in my punk rock bands, and I had guilt and shame, and I needed to get rid of that guilt and shame. I, I felt that I, in some significant sense, needed forgiveness. And I found that the forgiveness that Jesus offered was exactly what I was looking for. Number three, Jesus is the mo most influential person in human history for good reason. As I discussed yesterday, this is what I call the uninventability of Jesus. No one could have invented that story. Reason number four, the historical manuscripts of the Bible are reliable. Lyle Southwell talked to us about that yesterday. The prophecies of the Bible are amazing and they are accurate. And I wish I had time to talk to you more about that. Reason number six, these prophecies point not just to the end of the world in some you know, cataclysmic sense, but they point to Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Number seven, the Bible's prophecies bring hope and confidence. And number eight, it all just made sense. The idea of God sending advance notice of what's going to happen makes sense and shows God's fatherly care. And so on June 6, 1996, I made the decision to become a follower of Jesus. Not just me, but there was a whole group of us that from our punk rock community, there's Justin White, Ginger White, David Asherick, Violetta Asherick, Daniel Mason, Nathan Renner, Becky Renner, a whole group of us former punk rockers became followers of Jesus. Four out of four people in that picture were former punk rockers, and four out of four people in that picture went on to become Christian pastors. Um, it's really quite an amazing story. And we weren't required to dress like that, but we just did anyway. <laughs> and so I became really passionate about telling the message to others and my good friend, Nathan Renner, who was the first person I ever gave Bible studies to, and he became a follower of Jesus. Today, he's one of my best friends in the world, and uh, he travels all around the world just like I do. In fact, this became the subject of a book that was written by our good friend, Jennifer Schwerzer, called Twice Upon a Time, the David Asherick and Nathan Renner story, that highlights the tremendous similarities between Nathan's story and David's story. 
I want to close with this slide. A moment ago, I showed you my punk rock values. Let me show you now what my biblical values are. Social consciousness and love for others. Equality, nonviolence, and positivity. A straight edge and healthful lifestyle. A passionate concern for animal welfare. A passionate concern for environmental responsibility. And a strong desire to question authority, tradition, and norms. Did you notice that the values are exactly the same? That's what I mean when I say, I didn't used to be a punk rocker. I'm still a punk rocker. Because now with Jesus, I not only have the what, I have the why of life and love. I want to leave you with the very same slide that I left you with in the first talk that I gave. If the Son sets you free, Jesus said, you will be free indeed. So that's the story of the punk and the parsley and the prophet. All right, do you know what a punk rocker is now? Yeah, a little bit. I've a better idea. Yeah, thank you for enlightening me. Uh, we have a, a question for you, David, and that is, what is the secret to the perfect tray flip, and do you make your own slides because they are excellent? I, I didn't oh, write that oh, okay. question. That's, okay, so yeah. the first question is, what's the secret to the perfect tray flip? Uh, a tray flip, otherwise known as a 360 flip, is a skateboard maneuver. And uh, the, so let me just give you a quick illustration here. I wish we had a skateboard. We don't. Um, but a 360 flip. Oh, bring it up. Bring it Bring it. Bring it. Oh, my word. What is it? Security? Bring it up. Bring it up. What, what's with that? Perfect. Did you, did you plant that? No, I did not plant that. Okay. Yeah. So now let me just. Oh, yeah, we're fine. Okay. So I'll just explain a couple things here. This is. This is not my skateboard, by the way. Um, so typically, you would have your own skateboard, and you'd, be able, you'd, you'd sort of know it. But so in skateboarding, the, the most basic maneuver in skateboarding is what's called an ollie. Does anybody know what an ollie is? An ollie is where you, you can see I'm not attached to the board, right? The board is separate from me, but it is covered on the top with grip tape. And the most basic maneuver is to, to do an ollie, which is you jump the board up. And you do that by snapping the tail, which causes the, the board to come up, you're right, you have basic physics, as you put motion down, the equal and opposite motion is going to bring the board up, right? So there's a bit of a trick here. We'll see if I can do a quick ollie for you, which is just a simple move, right? That's how you just jump your skateboard. So once you've learned an ollie, then skateboarders try to start to say, well, wait, what else can I do? And you start to do 180 ollies, 360 ollies, front side 180s, back side 180s, and then you start to do what are called shove -its. Now, a shove -it is just what it sounds like. It's where you take the board and you're going to shove it around so that it's going the opposite way of where you started, right? So a shove -it would look something like this. Wow. Right? So that's a shove -it. That's what's called a backside 180 shove -it. So that's when you shove the board backside and 180. You can also do front side 180 shove -its, front side 360 shove -its, back side 360 shove -its. But the specific question that the questioner is asking is what's called a 360 kick flip or a tray flip. Now, a tray flip is a, not an easy trick by any means. It's actually quite a fun trick. And what happens with a tray flip is the board turns 360 on this axis, but it also flips on this axis, okay? <laughs> so. We ha hey, we have not cleared this with workplace health and safety, yeah, yeah. David. So please. Don't worry, don't worry. I probably won't. <laughs> Let me just tell you the story. So, so the question is, how do you do the perfect tray flip? And the mistake that a lot of people make, and I know this is like everybody's dying to know. That <laughs> I know that many of you have been working on your, many of you have been working on your tray flip. So let me just tell you how you do it. Okay, the mistake that people make, and I'm a goofy footer, okay? So that means that I put my right foot forward. If I stood with my left foot forward, I'd be called a regular footer, right? So I'm a goofy foot. So if you're a regular foot, just imagine that it would be the other way. So in... In a tray flip, the mistake that a lot of people make is they try to put their right foot too far back and too far to the side, their front foot, I should say. And they think that the trick to doing a tray flip is in the front foot. It's not. It's actually in the back foot. This, I can't believe I'm giving this. This is so funny. I can't either. Okay. So the trick is you want to take your back foot and hang it well over the edge of the tail, right? In a typical ollie, you have your foot right in the middle of the tail, back here. But you want to hang that toe way over here. And then, I'll just sort of show you the motion. It's actually easier to show it to you without the skateboard. 
Instead of putting your right foot forward like this, that's actually not the way. That's what you think when you see a tray flip. It's actually taking the back foot and really kicking the board like that, right? The back foot has to really flick the board back. And uh, I'd be tempted to show it to you on this board, but I can just tell right now that the trucks are too loose. I don't ride my board quite like this. So that is the trick. It's in the back foot. You hang the toe over, and you really flick the back foot out. The front foot will take care of itself. <laughs> hey, let's give him a hand. Thank you, David. And uh, that was amazing. I don't know what it is about these New South Wales pastors. The coolness factor is unbelievable. You got David, you got Rome, you got Red Dog. <laughs> you guys are amazing. Anyway, David is coming back in a few uh, minutes, a little later this afternoon. So we look Yeah, I'll be to back that. this afternoon. Thanks, guys. Thank him again. Wow.